Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this Studium Generale program. We're going to dim the lights just a little because in the next hour we're going to immerse ourselves in space. And the reason we're doing this is because we're going to learn all about the latest innovations in food technology and the future of food. Um, by 2050, our planet will need to feed no less than 10 billion people. And let's face it, preferably in a somewhat sustainable way. This is no easy challenge, obviously. Uh, so now is the time to look at food and its production in original and efficient ways. On Earth, but also across the universe. Because, yeah, who knows where we might end up living in the future. Today we have two speakers uh, who will be discussing the latest ideas, innovations and discoveries in food production, both on Earth and in space. Tech philosopher Kurt van Mensvoort and exobiologist Wieger Wamelink, both of whom happen to be involved in the space farming exhibition that is currently on display uh, at the Evelyn here in Eindhoven. If you don't know the Evelyn yet, it is the building that very much looks like it's about to set off uh, into space itself. So uh, you're very warmly welcome to visit that exhibition. We'll hear more about it during the lectures as well. We have two lectures today, one on the uh, future of food and one on the actual science of space farming. Uh, there's room for one or two short questions after each lecture and then at the end we have some time left for a joint discussion. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Kurt van Mensvoort. He's a tech philosopher, a designer and the director of the Next Nature Network. Uh, the Next Nature Network explores the changing relationships between people, nature and technology. Um, they are also the organizers of this uh, exhibition in Evelyn. Some of you already uh, may know Kurt because he's also working at TUE as a university fellow as of Next Nature at the Department of uh, Industrial Design. Um, Kurt, you are, I think, the person to show us all about the future of food and what it could look like if we dare to dream big. I'm just looking at the last people. Yeah, it's great that you all find a seat. You're not allowed to sit on the stairs, so if you can all squeeze in, we can all have a look. Well, seated. Please give a very warm welcome to Kurt van Mensvoort. Uh, a while ago, I was walking in the dunes with a friend and I saw there this strange tree sticking out amidst the other trees. I uh, thought, what's happening there? We went closer to take a look. It turned out that this is not a tree, it's a cell phone antenna mask disguised as a tree. And now, why are we doing this? Because um, yeah, I think clearly this is not nature, um, it's technology. Um, but we like to also design our environment according to a desired image of nature. And I think that's important to know for the future of food. Um, some more examples, this is near Berlin, very big building, and then ins inside the building people are enjoying, well, nature. Uh, this is the biggest uh, indoor beach in Western uh, Europe. Clearly, this is also, it's, it's, it's not nature. Um, we have some practices in, uh, well, Dubai. Um, people might know these uh, Palm Islands or the world map. Dutch companies create this. Um, and there's also a plan for the Netherlands that was proposed uh, some years ago to make a nice tulip island in front of the Netherlands. I thought, like, okay, it has been done already. Let's not think of something original. Um, yeah, maybe no. Well, I think this would be uh, good uh, country marketing. Um, we also have something in the Netherlands, because we're moving into the world of nature, farming and food. What, that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. We have prehistoric regenerated nature. So what happens? We win land from the ocean or we buy land from farmers. And then we tell the farmers to move somewhere else. And then we create... Uh, a natural landscape according to our idea of what it should be. Um, actually, these cows, they are, um, well, they're, they're replacing the prehistoric cows that used to roam Europe. But they became extinct in the 17th century. But now we have these Scottish Highlander that's sort of like the Brad Pitt of uh, uh, nature uh, conservation. Uh, they walk, walk around there. Um, we also build nature in the Netherlands. This is the Mark of Wadde. So here we created an, is uh, an island in the ocean. I went there a few years ago. I had to wear this hard hat because it was a construction site officially. Legally, I had to wear a hard hat. But in a few years' time, people will walk there and enjoy nature. And they say it's so wonderful, you know. Um, much of what we 
cold nature is being cultivated. And uh, this is nothing new. We have been doing this for centuries. Nature is also a very successful product. Um, I like you to, for the next week to 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 have some homework and to envision for yourself to count the number of times that a product tries to sell itself to you with positive images of nature. I already did my homework, so I have a few examples. Well, clearly Apple is not a fruit company, right? Um, Lacoste uh, shirts, they are not made from crocodiles. Uh, the Bacardi bed, uh, yeah, the, it's not, the, the, the drink is not made from these bats. It's just referring to the nightlife of the animal. Uh, also the Puma sneaker is simply referring to the sporty image of the animal. Um, and here it becomes a bit weird and cynical. This is a green Hummer, so it's a little bit less polluting than the previous model. And then we paint it green and you say, yes, well, maybe not. Sometimes it's also utterly confusing. Uh, this is a uh, natural insecticide that um, yeah, basically so you can use it to kill off nature, but in a nature-friendly way. <laughs> I think this is sort of the situation we are in now regarding our notion of nature. And um, we all know that sex sells, but I tell you here today, nature sells even better. And as we are doing this, of course, we're also engraving this positive view of nature. Nature as the wonderful, harmonic, balanced force of life. Um, However, nature also has this dark side, you know. It can be unpredictable, cruel, uh, but we kind of, well, we kind of strategically keep that out of our minds. Um, so why is it that so many people want to save nature, want to restore our balance with nature, but hardly ever anyone says like, okay, hey, what is our image of nature? How is that developed and how might it be changing today and in the future? I want to talk to, do, to you, of course, about the future uh, of food, um, of farming, um, of plant food, and also a little bit of the future of meat. So that's the agenda for the next uh, like uh, 15 minutes. Um, first about the future. Um, we typically think you have today, and then there is the future. This is, this is completely wrong, you know. There are many, many futures. It's an entire spectrum. Some of these futures, they will never happen. They're just fantasies. Uh, within that space, you have a smaller era of futures that might happen. Uh, they're possible futures. And within that space, there's an even smaller era of... yeah futures that are probable. So look out, because this, this is really probable that it will happen. Well, I try to be this radar for all these futures and plot out both the dreams and the nightmares, make them very tangible, and then have a better conversation about, hey, what future do we want? What do we want? And I'm also happy to be here today at the Studium Generale setting, because uh, we worked together previously, and I'll show some products. Um, that uh, also uh, we did together, but that's for later. First, some examples of what I did. This is a, a, an example of future food that I designed in 2007, so over 15 years ago, for the Coca-Cola company. And I thought, guys, if the green movement is happening, then in due time, you know, when we reach the summit, there will be green cans in the supermarket. I thought this, this will never happen, but a few years later, yes, this was on the market. Um, I, you might also know me from the, the world's first in vitro meat uh, cookbook. Um, yeah, it's basically, can we grow meat without having to slaughter an animal simply by gathering cells from the animal, growing them outside of the animal, and then create meat? And this research was started in the Netherlands and also in this university uh, in 2011, a long time ago. And then we explored in the cookbook 45 recipes you cannot cook yet. Uh, so, for example, the knitted meat, if it's too difficult to 3D print an entire steak, but you could make thin threads, then you could have this um, yeah, future uh, ritual where grandmother is knitting the meat in the kitchen. That, yeah, that's kind of like a first application. Also, if you realize you grow meat without having to slaughter an animal, you do this under very controlled, clean... Uh, circumstances, and you might be able to create meat that is uh, healthier, um, well, softer. Do you want to, it to look like a lab aesthetics? We call this honest from the lab. 
Um, final example from the cookbook is my favorite, simple sausage, nothing special, but we created this sausage from the cells of Pookie, and Pookie is a little pig that lives on the city farm. Um, we take some cells from the pig, we grow the sausage, and then you can feed the sausage to your child. And the next day you take your child to the city farm and you say, yes, they're spooky and the pig is still alive. We don't have to slaughter the animal anymore to grow the meat. Now, this would change our consumptive attitude towards animals. Is this a future we desire? You know, I'm signing on. Um, it's not in the supermarket yet, however, I also created my own future supermarket and I see Lucas, is the, the, the director of Studio Generale, is nodding because we did this project together some years ago. Uh, a nano supermarket with products that might be on the shelves um, in the next uh, few years. Um, both food and non-food, this is uh, the most popular product in our nano supermarket bus, a wall smart interactive paint, you put it on the wall only once and then you can change the color of your wall as many times as you like with your uh, smartphone. Uh, who would buy this? Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I have to say there's the feasibility indicator on top, so we kind of know how to make this piece of wall smart paint, but the entire wall is still too difficult, too expensive, doesn't have a business model. Uh, so yeah, we have to wait and see. Um, we also created a nano wine, the wine that contains nano capsules, and when you just drink it, they go through your body, you don't notice, but when they open, they alter the taste of the wine and you do this in the microwave, not to heat the wine, but only to alter for three to five seconds to, 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 to program your wine. The entire winery in one bottle. You can turn a basic Merlot into a more heavy uh, Pinot Noir or Malbec. Um, I, who would buy this? Ah, it's a bit like, yeah. I know in the Netherlands people are typically like, eh. we also went to Italy and to France with our nano supermarket. No nano wine. <laughs> no, no, because you know, uh, this culture of wine is then transformed uh, in one go. And um, yeah, do we want this? New technology not only brings us new products, but also new cultures, and we need to realize that. Something I'm waiting for to, um, is the Google Nose. Uh, we all know the Google Glass, right? But uh, the Google Nose is the next step because uh, our digital world, well, it doesn't do anything with smell. This entire human sense is completely ignored in the digital realm. And this is a pity. But uh, with the Google Nose, you can smell at the level of a police dog. Now, you think of some applications. Um, another food product that we envision is uh, the uh, pharmaceutical sushi. And basically, here the idea is that everyone has a personalized sushi set that also contains all your medication. Are we ready to combine medicine and food? Uh, right now, in our world, it's kind of two domains. Is this shifting? Um, one step further, or maybe another step, is the coating cola. Um, here the idea is that you have a a cola that's not only light, but it, uh, if you drink it, then you have this nano coating on your, the inside of your stomach. And for 24 hours, you don't only, well, you basically block all calories. So you drink one can of coating cola and then 24 hours, everything flushes through your body. Who would buy this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is also, I think many people, yeah, yeah it's light, it's, it's good, but uh, we still have also people on the world who don't have enough food, and then I drink the cola, coating cola, and, and then I just flush through all the calories. It's, mm, should we have a conversation? I don't know. Um, this is another one that's a bit tacky. Um, yes, what is it? It's the energy belt. Um, as you know, many people in the world now uh, have, uh, well, overweight. That's seen as something negative. Um, however, it's also energy storage. So yes, with the energy belt, you can smart, uh, charge your smartphone with your own belly fat. Again, who buys this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here I also thought, uh, okay, should we... Well, you could also char uh, use it to charge your Twitter implant. That's the next step, of course, Xplant now, right? New products from Elon Musk. Um, basically, everything that happens inside your body is being Xed out. And... Um, 
So yeah, if I have uh, do a lot of running, it will be ixed, it will be shared on social media. But if I uh, drink too much of the nano wine, it will also be ixed. And I get this for free from my health insurance company. Yeah, anyone who buys this? No. Yeah, so apparently this is a dystopian product, this is a nightmare. We can do it, but maybe we should not uh, do it. And that's the conversation we need to have, because technology is becoming increasingly intimate. Um, here's an example of the healing game. I have to say it's quite speculative if you look at the feasibility indicator, but the idea is I take a smart pill, a nano pill, then I start steering that pill inside my body, searching for evil cells in my body that I then have to destroy. So it's finally a healthy game. Some products are also just uh, uh, sustainable and innovative, like this uh, algae lamp. Algae, they live on sunlight, photosynthesis. And then we take a little bit of energy from the algae to light uh, the lamp. If you turn it on too often, then it's bad for the algae. You have to replace it. So it's very clear connection between biology and technology, um, which is also the case in the final product I want to show you. This is the Honest Egg. Uh, right now, if I walk into a supermarket, you know, you have all these brands, 26 brands of eggs, and you can choose, like, which one is the most expensive, the green, um, which one is the best for the chicken? Well, here you, uh, we altered the metabolism of the chicken, uh, to show on the shell of the egg if the chicken had a good life. So, yeah, regular white egg is good news, and a dark spotted egg, that means that the chicken had lots of stress, uh, not much light, not much room. Um, yeah, it's the honest egg. Again, I have to add, uh, this is still very speculative. I don't expect this within the next decade, but it is part of a development that I think is very important in our society, and this is that we are now living in a world in which the born and the mate are increasingly uh, fusing. Um, and as a result, we're also a bit confused about nature and culture, um, because typically we thought nature, that is everything that is born or emerged. Think of plants, uh, animals, the climate, uh, the universe. These are natural things. Uh, yeah, and culture, that's what we make. But uh, now this is becoming confusing, or maybe it's shifting, and I want to get into this with a simple graph that, uh, well, sure, you're smart people, we can all understand. Um, if I put on one axis born versus made, and I create then another axis where I put um, controlled versus autonomous or uncontrolled, then I've now created uh, four quadrants, and I can put all kinds of things in these quadrants to understand the world around us. Well, let's start in this born controlled quadrant. There we find things like uh, a rainbow rose, a bonsai tree, genetically modified banana or chicken. Um, these are natural born entities that we manipulate to the level that you say, sorry, this is not nature anymore, this is technology. There's also still a lot of natural born nature left that we do not control. Uh, think of, well, viruses, uh, volcanoes, uh, lightning, the sun. You know, the sun is so much bigger than us. We have zero control on the sun. Uh, we are 100% dependent on it. So no, we're not uh, the masters of the universe. Uh, we're not gods. We can be a bit modest still, even though there's a lot that we as humanity can make and control. Uh, think of uh, cars, uh, telephone, robot dog or light bulb. Not too exciting, but in the upper quadrant, things become more interesting, I think. Things that we create, but we do not control. Um, traffic jams, uh, digital networks, computer viruses, artificial intelligence, uh, cities perhaps, uh, the financial system. Yes, we created it, but are we still in control? What is happening. Um, a question you could, well, or maybe an observation you could make is that uh, we used to think of nature as everything that is born, but it might be more appropriate to think of nature as everything that is, well, sort of growing autonomous, that has its own dynam natural dynamics, even that what sometimes we created it. Uh, yeah, this might happen, but that's also, I think, a mind shift that we're in now, 
because typically we think of nature and technology still as opposites. But here we're learning that, well, nature is dynamic, not static, and technology is transforming uh, the natural world into a next nature. Now back to uh, the future of food, uh, because a question you might ask, if you want to go move into the future of food, in which quadrant do you want to live? Where do you want to define the future of food? And I notice there are different perspectives from di different people. Uh, you have the group that, uh, that wants to go in that yeah, born uncontrolled quadrant, you know, basically back to the natural paradise where you hunt and gather and you wait for the coconut to fall and then you find it. Um, well, that, that is a choice. Uh, there's also on the opposite side people who say, no, we should define the future of food entirely. Um, we take pills to have our nutrition, uh, soylent, uh, shakes, powders, and we, we just engineer this. That's another perspective. Um, although often the people who try to move in this perspective, they end up in the made uncontrolled uh, perspective. Uh, there's a lot of examples there where we have processed engineered food that is also, well, <laughs> is it really serving us? Uh, think of the Big Mac, the shakes, the, um, the processed chips, uh, the diet, food. Uh, it's kind of striking that the same company uh, creates Ben & Jerry ice cream and then also the diet shake. Uh, is this serving humanity? What is going on? Uh, and then the final quadrant that I should discuss, of course, that is yeah, more the bio-design kind of world, where we... Um, and you see this in the supermarket already. Uh, the Dutch tomato is quite famous, super processed. Um, I, s I see here the golden rice also. Uh, that's a big discussion. Do we want to geo-engineer rice? Well, maybe we find it unnatural, but what if we can save million, millions of children in the, in the world with it? Then maybe we want to move into that quadrant. I think it's open for discussion. Where do you want to be? Um, definitely, what's always happening when we talk about the future of food, you have this conversation about our food future, and then immediately someone starts to talk about what technology can do. And then after that, immediately someone says, like, it's unnatural and we should not do it. This is typically, this is the dynamics of the conversation we have. And I think this is a wrong frame. Especially if you realize that humans, we, we have been technological from the very first day that we are human. And basically, cooking is our first invention. The fact that we cook our food, other animals don't do it. There was this genius ancestor some 200,000 years ago that envisioned or discovered that you basically could extend your stomach in the outer world, pre-digest your food before you eat it, uh, intake more calories in less, less time, grow bigger brains, and basically become modern human beings. Uh, we have been technological for the, from the very first day uh, that we are human, and also agriculture is an example. Uh, today we talk about the biotechnologies that are emerging in our life, but some 10,000 years ago, agriculture was an invention. Uh, if you see these ladies planting crops with the hand, waiting for them to grow, then you might think, whoa, that's organic farming, that's good, that's natural. But this whole idea of planting crops, waiting for them to grow, and then harvest them, that was once a big invention that shifted everything. No more hand hunting and gathering on the savanna, no uh, plant crops, wait for them to grow, settle down, live in villages, later cities. And today, of course, with 8 billion people on the planet without agriculture, that's no longer possible. Um, a concrete example from our life, I think, is, is the banana. We tend to think uh, the banana in the supermarket, is it natural? Well, it cannot... <laughs> the wild banana has these thick seeds and it's, it's really small. And these bananas, they are cloned. Uh, it cannot replicate itself, so we need to clone the plant to do it. So it, the banana we see in the supermarket is already a design, but we don't realize it. And this shifts time after time um, from the very first day that we discovered the stone eggs, uh, the domestication of fire, 
uh, agriculture already mentioned, uh, to the invention of uh, the wheel, the, uh, the, the, the writing, um, money, the industrial revolution, and to the bio, info, nano technologies of today. So this is one movement, and you see that we have been technological from the very first day that we are human, and it is impossible to envision a future for humanity and the planet without looking at uh, technology and basically yes we're doing the same thing all over again which is well we're playing with fire Prometheus gave us the fire and since then well every time we discover a new kind of fire that gives us new opportunities new powers but also new risks and new responsibilities and you can say you should not play with fire you and some people do that they say you should not do it but that's also a denial on what it means to be human. So I would say, yes, we play with fire and we have to be very, very concise on do that in the right way and find a future uh, together there. And I'm positive because it's also a big wonder that we got this far already. We will never live without nature. Nature just uh, changes along with us. It's not static, it's dynamic. And basically technology also defines our next nature. Well, and now, having said all that, will there still be cows in the field in 2050? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the first person that milked a cow uh, did something, well, perverse in a way, like you to, to steal the milk from an other animal that has just been pregnant, right? Um, but also, it was an innovation, and... How can we continue? I cannot predict the future. I know the best way to predict the future is to simply uh, create it. And uh, a spot where we do that and where I'm also the director is in this uh, spaceship, uh, where I also all invite you uh, after the talk to run and go there and uh, uh, take a look at our space farming exhibition that explores this future of food and where we can go, where we should go. Um, and yeah, what will be the next chapter in our food. If you want to know more about everything I said, there's also a book, and I, today I have the gift for you that uh, you can join the Next Nature Network, and then we send you the book and you only uh, pay the shipping cost. So that's, that's my gift to involve you. Thank you for now, and uh, I'm also very curious what our next speaker, Wieger, will Say. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you very much, Kurt. Is there a short question for now that someone would like to, a short question or comment? If not, it's also totally fine because then I yes. suggest, Kurt, we first move on yeah. to our next presentation and then we see you back for the discussion. Because, um, well, we've heard a lot about the possibilities of uh, the future of food. Uh, but what about growing food in actual space? Well, there is someone studying this here on Earth. His name is Wieger Wamelink. He's an uh, ecologist and exobiologist at uh, Wageningen University. His uh, regular research includes plant soil relations and the effects of climate change on plant species and vegetations. Um, but as a, as a very serious side project, I think, Wieger, um, he started uh, the Food for Mars and Moon project already 10 years ago with the aim of feeding future human settlers and establishing a sustainable agricultural system on other planets um, to boldly grow where no plant has grown before, Wieger. Uh, the floor is yours, Wieger Wameling. Thank you. Yes, to boldly grow. <laughs> we will see about that. Um, well... Uh, if you want to know more after my talk, I start with, in Next Nature, in Evoluon, we also have uh, an exhibition set. Uh, we're growing there several crops as if they would grow on Mars. So if you want to know more and if it is actually possible, go and look there. Or go to Mu, but I'll end with that. So, um, growing crops in space, is it new? No. Uh, it's already done, and actually, it's already done a long time ago. This is in the ISS, that's Faggy, that's going on now. They're growing, well, vegetables, which, of course, is possible, we can see. I don't see really the purpose of it at the moment. 
because, uh, well, a salad is nice, but it's not going to feed you. So we do it from a different angle. I really want to feed people in space. And then you have to go beyond a salad. Uh, but it has already a long history. Uh, NASA did that already in Skylab, huh, the predecessor of uh, uh, ISS. And uh, they made important discoveries already back then. For instance, that plants are phototropic. Huh, on Earth, a plant knows where it has to grow its roots and where to grow its leaves. The leaves have to go up and the roots go down. They can measure gravity. But on Skylab and the ISS, there is no gravity. Yeah, well, a little bit, microgravity. The first experiment they did, they put a seed in Skylab, gave them a little bit of water, and what was happening was it was sprouting, but it was also forming roots and it was growing everywhere. So through each other. The plant did not know anymore what was up and what was down. But then someone came with the idea, let's put one light on top of it, instead of light coming from everywhere. And then we saw that the plant then again knew what was up and what was down. We never could have invented that on Earth, but that is what you could do in space. So it also gives you new knowledge, even about growing plants. Something you can't sometimes do on Earth. Feeding people on Earth, it was already said, we have got, well, maybe 10 billion people on Earth. How on Earth are we going to feed them? Uh, in Wageningen, we're doing a lot of research to see if it's possible. Well, I can tell you, actually, it is already possible now. But you have to stop eating meat. Then it's possible. And you have to stop wasting your food, which we do in huge amounts. Go to the bins later on here and you will see it. So, actually, we have enough food. But the idea maybe is, can food come out of space? Uh, I've got an opinion about that. We'll talk about that later. But first question, is it possible? Well, it is possible in the ISS. But I think one of the biggest adventures of the 21st century is to send people to Mars. We've never been there. Well, as far as I know. Um, uh, so, if people go there, it is a trip of nine months. You will have to live there, and it is nine months back, and you will stay there for a while. Now, of course, you can bring your own food, and probably we will, just to make sure, but it makes much more sense to grow your own food over there. We do that for Mars, the research, but we also do that for the Moon. I will focus today only on Mars. <laughs> oh, I thought we have to leave, but <laughs> it's just... <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> she has. Um, to <laughs> um, so, to Mars. Well, if this happens on Mars, eh, you want to have your own food there and be able to grow your own food. Uh, for people who have seen the Martian, they know why. Eh? If there is no food, you have a problem. But it makes much more sense to grow your own food at the site. It's more co uh, economical. Eh? Otherwise, you have to ship in, in a spaceship, every time your food, and it's very vulnerable. So, if you go and live there, do research, then you're going to live there, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, normally, it's minus 60 on Mars. If you have a beautiful, nice day, it's 20 degrees above at the pole. Uh, at, no, not at the poles, at, at the equator. But normally it's very cold. At night it's minus 100. So that's already a problem for me to grow plants. Huh? Impossible. There is no liquid water on Mars. Second problem. We've got an atmosphere on Mars, but it's very thin. It's about the same as what you would have 30 kilometers above the Earth, so we cannot breathe there, but plants cannot live there either. NASA tried, they came to air pressure of about 10% of what we have here, but then it's over. And on Mars it's much lower, it's about 0.3%, so it's impossible. Uh, then we've got radiation, cosmic radiation on Mars. On Earth we're protected, we've got our atmosphere, which is almost absent huh, on Mars, 
but we also have our magnetic field. Uh, lately, there's been a lot of uh, sightings of uh, uh, on uh, L uh, the solar wind arriving at Earth, and you could see the lightning at the poles, especially North Pole was visible in the Netherlands. Um, that's actually the solar wind coming in and Earth protecting us, the magnetic field and the atmosphere. On Mars, this is not the case. Mars does not have a magnetic field. So, cosmic radiation ends up on the surface, which is a problem for humans, a huge problem, but also a problem for plants. So, you have to go indoors and below ground to protect yourself and the plants from poisonous radiation. You have to have a layer of at least and I say at least, because nobody actually knows, three meters on top of your home or dome. And that is what is depicted here. This is the way you will live on Mars, and also the vegetables will be grown indoors. But that makes my life a lot easier, because I have controlled circumstances. I can make normal air pressure. I can have Earth uh, composition of atmosphere. We use LEDs, and then, in principle, you can start. And we want to use as much as possible what is available on Mars, which means there is a kind of soil called regolith. It's dead, no life in it, no organic matter in it. But it is there, and it has nutrients in it, so you could use it. Um, I also want to use ice that is available on Mars. So what we got is the regolith. Huh? We can grow the crops inside. We have got ice, so water. Um, there is a little bit of CO2 in the atmosphere. Actually, that's the main component of the atmosphere of Mars, so we can make... Ah. It was about food. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm going to talk about food and food poisoning later on, so <laughs> maybe it will <laughs> uh, fit in. Um, we've got a little bit of N2 and a little bit of oxygen. So, in principle, we can use that also to make an atmosphere on Mars indoors. We could also artificially made it, make it. That's an option. But this is my starting point. Now, uh, what we've learned already 10 years ago when we started with our first experiment, just growing crops is not enough. Huh? Then you eat it and then it's over. That's actually what they do at the moment at the ISS. Then you have to ship in new seeds every time. That's not handy. So we need more than just growing crops. We need a sustainable agricultural ecosystem. And actually, we don't need that only for Mars, but we also need that here on Earth, and especially in the Netherlands. I know, coming from Wageningen, but uh, I think we've forgotten about that. Uh, so what we're doing is not only for Mars, but also for Earth, to get a more sustainable agricultural ecosystem. And it has several components, and that's where we're looking into, and I will show examples later on, uh, if it is working. So first of all, of course, we need the plant, in this case a pea. We can eat the pots, uh, and especially the peas, but the peas are also seeds. So we ha don't want to eat everything, uh, we have to have it for the next generation. Um, then, the plants need to be pollinated. So we need pollinators. In our ex first experiment, we did that by hand. That's a lot of work. So we want to employ someone else to do that. So maybe bumblebees or flies, but we need pollinators for the next generation. Uh, I know we have self-pollinating plants, but even they have a better fruit setting if you pollinate them. So we still need them. Um, then, we have remnants of the plant. We don't eat everything. We've got the leaves, the stems, the roots. They have to be recycled. Well, earthworms can do that. So we want to bring them to Mars as well. Um, bacteria can help in that process to break down organic matter and to turn it into manure again for the plants. Fungi can help with that as well. And they can also do a little trick they can acquire phosphate, one of the key elements for plant growth. If you go to your garden center and you buy manure, then it has three components. Nitrogen, I'll come back to that later, phosphorus and potassium. So we need phosphate. But the phosphate is not readily available in that regolith. 
but some fungi can acquire that from minerals in the soil and feed the plants with it because they share it in exchange for carbon hydrates that they get from the plant. They live in symbiosis with each other. Isn't that nice? Um, we also want to apply bacteria for a special reason, and that's why I show a pea here, because there are bacteria, rhizobium bacteria, that live in the roots of plants, and they can acquire N2 from the air and turn it into nitrate. And if phosphorate is a problem on Mars, nitrate is most certainly a big problem because it's almost absent. The only source are solar wind and a little bit of lightning that you have in the atmosphere. But that's way not enough to grow a plant on. So we need those bacteria to turn the N2 that we artificially make in our dome to turn it into nitrate. And they li also, again, live in symbiosis with the plants. Now, then we have the humans. Let's not forget about them, because they have to eat microbes, of course, but I need them from something else. I, I, I want them there because I need their feces. I need their poo and their pee, so I can turn it into manure again to grow my crops. So humans are essential for my system, sadly. So, back to Mars. We've got a lot of information about what's going on on Mars. We've got a lot of information about the regolith that is there as well. Of course, you can already do that from Earth by remote sensing. They already did that in the 16th century. They knew Mars was red. Uh, anyone, any idea why Mars is red? Iron. Right. <laughs> yes, it's iron oxide. Mars has up till 25% of iron oxide in its soil. And then it's, of course, iron-3, eh? not iron-2, because that's grey. By the way, the moon is grey because we've got a lot of iron-2 in the regolith that is there on the moon. So that's the, the difference between Mars and the moon. So a lot of iron oxide. We already learned that from Earth. Now we've got uh, satellites uh, orbiting Mars, so they give a lot of information. But also, the rovers have laboratory on board. And they can do analysis of the soil. And it tells me exactly what the composition is of Martian soil. And I can tell you, it looks like Earth soil. Because also on Mars, it's about 50% of silicium oxide. The same as on Earth. Now, I want to do my experiments here on Earth. But there is no soil, no Martian regolith here on Earth yet. But I do my experiments. How do I do that? We've got those measurements. And you can just order it with NASA. And they ship it in. Um, what we're using is coming from a Hawaiian volcano or from a desert in the States. And that is almost the same as what you would find on Mars. Of course, it's purified. It's cleaned. It has no life in it, it has no organic matter in it, but basically it's the same as what you would find on Mars or on the Moon, as you can see, reddish grey. Uh, so this is what we are using instead for our experiments. Now, to our first experiments uh, in uh, 2013, what we also learned is that there is a lot, a lot of heavy metals in those regoliths. And we're talking about uh, arsenicum, lead, zinc, hey, all those things you don't want to eat. And if you put your plants in there and it starts to grow, and you eat it and you get sick, that's not a good idea. So, first experiment to test all that. And what we did was setting up a huge experiment. Uh, 100 seeds per... Uh, Species, we had 14 different species, uh, 20 replicas, and there was a reason for it, because we thought no phosphate, no nitrate, uh, heavy metals in it, even aluminium in the moon, soil simulant, so uh, no growth. Uh, so let's do a lot of seeds, then maybe one will germinate and we at least have one result. So many seeds. We had uh, 4,200 seeds in that first experiment, we wanted to follow them all. 
And actually we did, but it did cost a lot of effort because you can already see here, as part of the experiment, that everything germinated. Totally unexpected and on the Mars regolith, it started to grow. So we had lots of seeds to follow, but we managed. And what we learned from that first experiment is that plants did grow. They managed somehow, but we had tomatoes this size. So not the tomatoes itself, but the plants. So you cannot eat from it. But it was growing, which was already a huge success. And the garden cress, uh, 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 that grows everywhere. It's very easy to grow. And actually, that even flowered in that first year. And that already learned us that we need pollinators, because this needs to pollinate. So we did that with a little paintbrush, but it worked. But you cannot do that on Mars. So we learned that already from our first experiment, which was very successful. On the Mars regolith, not on the Moon regolith. Moon regolith has a pH of 10.5, which is unbelievable high and very bad for plants. And it has free aluminium, which is also toxic for plants, not only for humans. So most plants there did germinate, did grow a little bit, became very grayish and then died. But there was a huge difference. And at the end, we even had seeds. So in already in that first experiment, we had the result we wanted. We wanted the next generation. And that worked already. Now, second experiment. Of course, the plants were small, so you cannot eat. But we had, of course, organic matter from the previous experiment. So we mixed that through the soil and then started a new experiment. And that was a huge difference. Plants started to grow. You can see it here, we only had crops then, and after a while we could harvest the first radish, and even had the first tomatoes uh, that we could eat. But I didn't dare to eat them, because of the heavy metals. And the tomatoes were about this size, so not really big, but at least we had fruits. It was working. Now, then you have to test it, of course. Eh? Is it safe to eat? And normally we used to use the, uh, for that students, <laughs> but uh, I'm told that's not allowed anymore. I don't know how it is here in Eindhoven. But uh, in Wageningen it's strictly forbidden, so I had to come up, come up with another idea. So I invited someone who does stunts. I think the Dutch people will recognize her, Rachel from Checkpoint. She does all kinds of stunts uh, for children, so we asked them over, her over to, to try to eat the first radishes. And uh, we washed them very carefully in the bucket. You can see the bucket. Uh, that was because a radish grows in the soil, and we knew there are heavy metals in the soil. Eh? So you have to clean it very well before you can eat it. She did that in that bucket. And I told her, whatever you do, don't drink from that water. Eh? That makes sense. But our radishes, they grow very slowly. So they have a lot of taste, much more than you're used to when you buy it in the shop, in the supermarket. So she tasted it thought, whoa, okay, nice, whoa, it's kicking in now, it's really, really strong. So what I'm going to do, I want to drink something. So on camera, caught, she started drinking out of the bucket. I can tell you, she survived, uh, she's still making programs. Um, but that is, of course, not how we do it. Uh, we tested it extensively on heavy metals. Uh, and what we saw was that it is not taken up by the plants. And that's very nice, because then it's safe to eat. Uh, you can see here some examples. Uh, interesting is that in the control, Earth, that we always have, is potting soil. There is more lead in it than on the Mars and Moon regoliths. And they are coming from deserts. And our potting soil is coming from the Netherlands. And uh, people that are a little bit older, they will know that we had uh, in the past fuel in our cars that were leaded. Well, and it's still there in our environment. And you can see that when you do analysis. So uh, the regolits are coming from a clean area. And then the fruits are also cleaner if you grow crops on them. So that also tells me something. You have to be careful with your environment, because things like lead, you will never, never lose it, and it will stay in your environment. Whether you're on Mars or whether you're on Earth, it doesn't matter. Well, we also needed the worms, I already said, and I have a little movie here. What you see is the worms on the right part, not on the left part. On top you have a garden cress, and it's growing. 
And uh, we tested this. This is a time lapse. We wanted to see if the worms were behaving normally. And you can look at the movie and see that they are digging burrows, that they're going to the surface to look for food, and if they don't find food, then they will eat just your crop, which you don't want. Uh, but they are very lively and they're doing their job. And it was a question, of course, will the earthworms survive in these soils? And I can tell you, they do. And I brought some with me, so who wants to see some earthworms later on? I brought them because I'm going to apply them later on at, uh, uh, at MU, where we have a new exhibition and where we will show actually in life as well what we are mean with that recycling process that will be exhibited there. So uh, the crops were growing and the worms were surviving. Actually in our real experiment we even had offspring within three months. So then you know that they really like it and they can survive. Yes, next? Yeah. Well, I already said I have to recycle everything, which includes human urine. And uh, we've done some experiments with that. I don't think I stand there on top of my pots and I'm peeing on them. That's not how we do it. Uh, urine, you want to use it, but it has to be clean. You want, don't want anything into your food system, so you have to be careful. Uh, urine normally is clean, but not totally. What we do is that we add magnesium to it, then uh, you get a mineral, struvite, magnesium, ammonium, phosphate, and that mineral we apply, and it looks like a salt. And there's another reason why we did this, because the urine was collected at a festivals in Amsterdam in the Dixies, <laughs> and as you probably know, there could be something in your urine that we don't want to have in your food system. But there's another reason for it. Uh, we also do not want remnants of medicine that people take in our food system. So that's the reason why we take struvite out and use that as manure. But here you see an experiment that we did. On the left side, the first plant, very bad looking. You may think it's yellow, so did I pee on it? No. It's growing very poorly. It did not get any nutrients. So it is growing, it, it's even forming some beans, but it's not growing very big. Look at the right side, different plant, but same species with struvite. Well, you don't even do to ha to have to do the math to see that it works. Okay, then I... Yeah, yeah I'm almost finished. Then I had someone uh, over, uh, also known for TV, Dutch people will know him, uh, Tom Waas, and he donated his pool for our first experiment. And, well, some people have, may have seen it. Uh, we sterilized it to make sure that there are no bacteria in it, and we added that also to our regolith. And again, plants did grow. Here again, uh, this is what he did. I still have the label, of course, he signed it. I'm never going to throw that away. And, um, but the plants are growing, and that's also important. Uh, it looks a bit funny, but it is really important for our recycling process. And uh, there are actually people here in the Netherlands who are doing that at the moment as well. So they are recycling their feces again on their own land to grow their own crops. And especially important for the phosphate, because we will be out of that. Then, last slide. Uh, well, no, there's two more, <laughs> sorry. Um, Let's see if they can run. Yes, the mealworms. They can live on remnants of plants. And I always thought you will be vegetarian on Mars, because that's the most efficient way. But these are very efficient in turning waste into something you could eat. And we want to bring them as well, so you could have a little bit of animal meat. And there's a reason for it, because they contain all essential amino acids. And their protein content is 20%. So that's the same as in cow milk, already earlier discussed. Uh, and the, that is why we are now thinking of bringing them. And it's quite easy to bring them. Huh? You cannot bring a cow in a spaceship and then bring it to Mars. Don't know how to do that. But these are possible. Yes. 
Then a little bit about uh, the experiment, uh, well, the exhibition we are busy with now. Next Nature will be a mu. We will building this arch there, an explanation about that later on. And uh, well, our research is supported totally by crowdfunding and by selling some merchandise. This T-shirt is for sale. Well, no, actually not this one, but we have uh, some there, and you can support us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wieger. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who of you would uh, like to try a tomato from uh, Mars-grown soil? Okay, I see like uh, maybe, maybe 15, 20 hands. Who, who would like to try uh, one of those mealworms? <laughs> one brave person, okay. You can uh, do that after the show. No. We, we, <laughs> we already serve the complete din dinner uh, out of the crops that we grow on the uh, regolith uh, for, for our crowdfunders. So it's completely safe and it, to and eat. And they were all stunned women. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to make an, uh, yes. one the space potato uh, together, right? In the yeah. space farming. That yeah. will be, uh, it has to grow a bit. Is, yes. is a potato the next crop that you're interested in? Or? No, we're already growing them. You're I already, already, growing I already them. tasted them, and actually the potatoes are growing very well because it's a kind of sandy soil, and they like really to grow in it. Okay, easy peasy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, relatively easy. Yeah. Are there any questions for one of the speakers or for both? I see one all the way up the back. We have a catch box, so oh. Sveta is going to throw that your oh. way. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. If you can speak in the black part. Um, in terms of feasibility, do you think if, uh, aside from like going there and building the habitats, uh, how many years or decades would you say are needed until this is feasible to actually do on Mars? Me first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I want to start with the moon, because uh, ISS will be demolished somewhere in the near future, and I think the next step will be to build an ISS, but then on the moon. Uh, we're going back in two years, so I think within ten years we will have a settlement there on the moon. Uh, I hope the first voyage to Mars will commence somewhere be between 2030-2040. And since it's so difficult, uh, probably we will stay there already and live there immediately. And then grow our own f food there as well. Uh, that may seem still far-fetched, but I'm sure we will go there at some point in time. So that, that's my schedule, 2030-2040. Yeah, I, I agree, and uh, we must realize that it's just super, super, super difficult to, to go to Mars, to, to live there, and sometimes in the media you hear people shout, like, I'm going to do this next year. But wait, no. and it's it's just very difficult. Elon Musk it might take waiting. it might take a lot more time. However, I think also the value of the research on how can you grow food on another planet and do this uh, with these uh, cycles that everything all the waste is food again. It's also very very important what we can learn on Earth because there we have a big challenge as well, and especially in the Netherlands where we import a lot of. Uh, um, manure. Manure, yeah. And, uh, and, and then we export the food. So yeah, what happens? That manure that stays here. Yeah. And, and you hear this in the news. Stickstoff and uh, all the issues. Uh, so the uh, space discussion. farming can also yeah. help us to live better on Earth. Maybe a final question, because I see people are eager to go. Um, we have a few minutes left, um, but we've, we've heard two very different stories about the future of food, so very sort of speculative about all the, the possibilities that this fusion of, of, of nature and culture has to offer, and then the very practical things that you run into as a scientist once you start to develop one of these projects. Maybe, Kurt, the final question to you, what do you think is, has the most potential for, for feeding all these people on Earth? Um, of those, maybe of those quadrants, where do you think people, okay. or what do you see in the expo? What are people most drawn to? Well, what uh, the work from Wieger is, is very attractive. We also have an installation in the expo where you can not only grow your own meat, but basically do cellular agriculture. And you can take cells from different crops, also animals, and you can blend them in your own dish. And you do this on an interface, and then you see a hologram uh, of what the dish will look like, and that's also super popular. Um, regarding your question, where do we end in yeah, the spectrum? In the, in the, I in think reality, what has not yeah. been mentioned is that uh, uh, the um, 
our challenges around food are very much also about distribution because there are one billion people on the planet who are basically they have overweight and there's also still one billion people on the planet who do not get enough food so the food is there but we have to get it in the right place in the right time and i'm i'm really convinced that with today 8 billion people in 2050 10 billion but after that it uh, it will be less that is 10 billion people in 2050 if we just make some smart decisions and we learn then we can make it. So I'm super op optimistic also. Which is also, Igor, what you said in, your, in the beginning of your talk, right? So we have everything yeah, already, we have, we but we have need it. to solve it smartly. Yes, we have to do it much smarter than we do at the moment. And uh, actually, we don't have to import uh, food from space, which will be very costly in energy. Well, so And it's also not going to come from Mars. And also, what pe some people think uh, Mars is planet B. No, it's not. Uh, it's way too difficult to grow your to live there, whatever Elon Musk says. <laughs> uh, we only have one planet, so we have to be careful with that one. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's end on that note. Kurt van Mensport and Micha Wameling. So go and learn more at the Evolvon or at the MU uh, or buy some of the merch. And uh, see you again at Studium Generale. <laughs>